Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Marble Palace. Saskatchewan Post Media's look at the Saskatchewan legislature and all political goings on in this province. I'm Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regina Leader Post. Joining me as always, Jeremy Symes, our legislative reporter for the Leader Post, and Phil Tank, uh, uh, our, well, I don't even know what to call you anymore. You work for the Star Phoenix, but congratulations. You are now, you have a new role in the digital world plus columnizing. Just describe that for a moment, Phil. Uh, digital opinion editor, and uh, I hopefully will be writing more columns uh, uh, than my one a week that I have been writing. So I hope so too, because uh, Phil is a hell of a writer and a good columnist and a good journalist. And that's why I will start with, off with you first, Phil. The Athabasca by election, which among startling developments that I've seen over my long gray haired period of uh, covering politics, this is certainly one. This is a seat that. Uh, the SAS party not only has never won, but nobody other than the Liberals and the NDP have ever won in its existence, and it roughly takes up a quarter of the province physically. Uh, yet, surprisingly, amazingly, uh, they won it and won it reasonably handily, notwithstanding uh, a horrendously low voter turnout in a cold February day in northern Saskatchewan during a pandemic. But tell us about those results, Phil. Uh, they're quite startling. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll send you the money for uh, saying that I'm a great writer. Uh, it's, in, it's in the mail. <laughs> you are. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe we can crowd, crowd, crowdsource it or crowdfund it. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so the, uh, let me address the turnout, first of all. It's 24%, which is low, uh, registered voters, which is low. But I looked at the turnout in 2020, and the voter, voting, voters that showed up last night are about 75% of what showed up in 20, uh, 2020 general election. So you can see that it's not that far off from, you know, it's lower. All by-elections tend to result in lower turnout. So it's not that far off. Um, Jim LeMay, who won for the, uh, and I'm sure the NDP went into this with a lot of confidence. They're, they're running Georgina uh, uh, Jolibois, who's a former MP and mayor of the Losh. Definitely a better known name than Jim, Le, Le, Jim LeMay for the SAS party. Uh, Jim LeMay got about 35 more votes than the SAS party candidate got in the um, 2020 election when the NDP won. But the NDP got 700 fewer votes than they did um, in, in that election. And part of the issue here was that, you know, the person who lost the NDP nomination, um, uh, Darwin Roy, uh, ran as an independent and, you know, took about 7% of the vote, which is, you know, a fair chunk for an independent to get. Didn't, you know, wouldn't have made, you know, if you add that onto uh, Jalabois' margin, it still wouldn't have, you know, it's yeah. Jim LeMake still would have won. But you do wonder whether that, uh, how much of that played a role. Plus the loss in votes uh, generally over the general election. Uh, it should be noted that Buckley Belanger, while he has held this seat and won it by fantastic sums in the early days, the 56, I think, 0.8 percent he won in 2020 wasn't startling. It was a good, sizable 600 vote win, but maybe there was a little bit more susceptibility uh, in this seat than we thought. Any guesses as to what the issue might have been, Phil? Because the premier was quick to tie it to the pandemic. And I go, oh, we'll get into that with Jeremy in a second, because he just has stepped out of that press conference virtually. Uh, but what do you what have you been hearing? What do you think might have been the issues uh, in uh, Athabasca that would cause such a uh, historic change in this particular seat? Well, yeah, it's difficult to, uh, it's difficult say, to yeah. say, right? I mean, it's such a wide area. It's such a, and it's it's suffered quite a bit in, under the pandemic. I mean, you, you'd think that, you know, the, uh, this summer, the Mo government said, when they took away all health restrictions, said, well, we'll put them back in if medical health officers ask for it. Well, the medical health officers up north did ask for restrictions and didn't get them until the rest of the province got them in September. So uh, you would think that would have uh, played in the NDP's favor, but you know, I mean, by-elections are strange. Like I say, it's a wide, uh, it's a very, very large uh, uh, constituency. Um, I know there's a new high school coming in Lalash that, that kind of never hurts. Um, so uh, yeah, it, 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 basically it's difficult to say what what. Uh, but like you say, it may it may have built on what what was happening in the, in the uh, last election that maybe uh, this uh, uh, the citizens here said, well, maybe we want representation in the government for a change. Maybe we should give that a try. So. And, and even though it's not by any stretch of the imagination an affluent riding, it's one in which certain areas. Uh, uh, 
of the writing have people that are uh, having good solid jobs in uh, the mining community, which probably reflects well in terms of the SAS party policies and a few other things. So maybe we are seeing a bit of a changing for face in the north, which I would think would be great news for Scott Moe and uh, and the uh, SAS party, and particularly great news to get an Indigenous candidate in this writing. And as Scott Mulva, I think, pointed out at least one tweet, uh, we now have uh, MLAs from border to border to border, which is quite fascinating to me. Here's the thing that I don't get, though. At his press conference that you just sort of came from, where he talked about this, uh, he didn't seem to me, and maybe this is just me, maybe you can get a better sense of it, Jer uh, Jeremy, but he didn't seem to me to be a premier celebrating a historic victory. He seemed to be wanting to make other points in relation to Ryan Miley and his relative popul unpopularity. This is certainly a high, tough blow for uh, Ryan uh, Miley to absorb right now because this is one of the few safer seats that the NDP has and their, and their caucus is minuscule already. But can you just sort of describe the Premier's mood, what he was saying about Miley and what he seemed to be messaging in the press conference that you just uh, emerged from, Jeremy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, not a great day for Ryan Miley. Obviously, this is considered a, a safe seat uh, historically. So, the Premier briefly mentioned, OK, yes, this is a historic moment for the SAS party. And then he went in and right away laid into Ryan Miley and the NDP. Basically, what the Premier is saying is uh, their rhetoric around um, calling these protesters we've seen at convoys as extremists um, has been divisive, according to the Premier. And that is um, turning voters away from the NDP. They're saying the SAS party is we're looking to unify people. Um, and we've seen the Premier already uh, give that message that lifting these mandates, all of that is an effort to uh, unify people. And so I guess he's uh, saying by Miley vilifying these some of these protesters, um, that's why we are seeing the turnout that we saw yesterday in Athabasca. I will mention he did mention that the, the result may have also had to do with uh, government policy as well like he mentioned the mining and forestry he did mention that as well and he was saying the investments in the schools and other investments up north may have also played a role in their victory um i'll just add to he was asked you know jim lemeg what's his role going to be in government uh will we see a cabinet position that has not been specified yet but he did mention that he will you know he'll play a role uh, of being a voice up north for those people who live there uh, who elected the, a government representative. Which they sorely lacked. And to be quite frank, it would be really hard uh, at some point or the other. I don't know if it's going to be the first cabinet shuffle we see after uh, the, that's available. But it will be hard to leave your lone in, uh, Indigenous and Northern member out of cabinet for Scott Moe right now. Tell me about the whole notion about the business, though, though because, and and I, I, I guess how Premier Scott Moe was articulating that view today because there are those who are going to argue, and quite rightfully so, that it's pretty divisive to block borders that keep us from allowing us to have trade in this province, which we are totally depend up, de dependent upon. Uh, certainly the language and the rests and coots, in other words, the extremism uh, is uh, that we have seen out of that is, is what it is. I, I don't know if Ryan Miley is really calling anybody out when he's basically talking about uh, 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 a situation where we've seen 11 arrests and, and at least four of them for some for conspiracy to uh, uh, commit uh, murder after the RCMP uh, uh, discover a cat uh, a arm uh, arms cash and body armor. How does Scott Moe separate those notions? I know he's always said that there's they're not all the protesters, but like how did how did he today uh, separate the notion that we have seen behavior, not just in Coots, but elsewhere, that uh, the Canadians aren't tolerating, don't want to tolerate, yet he's calling um, Ryan Miley and, and those who are criticizing the blockades uh, is the ones who are extremists. I, I don't understand that, to be quite frank. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess Mo is playing that that fine line in a way of 
being sympathetic to, I guess, the general message of this protest, being like we're against COVID-19 mandates, you know, it's evident he is against it. Uh, we're seeing those restrictions uh, lifting by the end of the month here. Um, and I guess how he's played it is where he will call out or condemn those specific actions that, you know, uh, that Miley has said are extreme and that a lot of people agree are really extreme. Um, but yeah, he, he plays this line where he'll condemn that and say, oh, well, everyone is not like that. You know, there's a lot of good people at these protests, that sort of thing. Um, I did write a piece uh, earlier this week that kind of touched on his change in messaging uh, over the last little while, especially when it came to blockades. Um, originally, when he was asked about it, he said, well, I'm not going to tell these protesters what to do. A day later, we see Mo come out and go, well, you know what, I'm I'm not for uh, illegal activity, but continue to protest lawfully. And then we see uh, a week later, uh, I'm a, please end these blockades um, and still standing firm on his message of I'm still sympathetic to the cause, guys, but please don't uh, do some of these disruptive things. So, yeah, it, it is interesting to see how uh, he does play to this acts, these aspects of the protest and, um, yeah, try to try to message it across. That was an interesting piece, and, and you got into how he had to walk back his initial comments on power and politics, in which he said that I'm not going to tell protesters what to do. And unfortunately, that was just days before the arrests were made. But is it, I think you're pointing out, Jeremy, he is speaking to at least two different groups and maybe more. And Phil, you did a, also did a wonderful piece uh, very recently, around last Saturday, I believe, uh, on the unified grassroots and the role that it has played in terms of influencing Scott Moe's messaging overall and maybe now influencing government policies because it has been since October, December when he was uh, talking quite openly with uh, uh, Nadine Ness and United Unified Grassroots, I'm sorry, uh, about uh, what their concerns were that we started to see that shift in Scott Moe's position. If you can, can you just sort of please outline for those listening out here, what your story was about and how you see it, not only playing into what's happened policy-wise, but what we're hearing and seeing in, in this very moment where we're seeing uh, Scott Mo talk about divisiveness and the need to get together, yet somehow basically talking directly to a group that, as your stories point out, don't all seem not all unifying to me. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that language of like stopping hate and division, that comes straight from them. That comes from what's written on their website. We want to stop the hate and division and coercion and discrimination and uh, and all that's fine. But, you know, the question like I write in my column that's coming up out tomorrow is like, OK, if you're only about spreading unity and love, as you claim, why do you need to operate behind the walls of a private Facebook group? And of course, if you spend any time on there, we have some sources inside the group that have showed us that, yeah, I mean, there's lots of vaccine hesitancy. They've had, they've speculated about going to one of the, you know, to a platform where they can more freely spread misinformation. They, of course, don't call it that, but, you know, that's uh, certainly the gist you get there. Yeah, so anyway, this group formed in about uh, September and, um, and came up, kind of kind of came out of nowhere for most people and right away challenged the at the end of the month challenged the uh, vaccine mandate that the province was coming in and failed miserably at that and had to pay court costs uh, everything and you know and that that kind of raises a question too like where does the money for this group come from especially then when you know they were they had just formed and suddenly they're challenging uh, um, they're seeking an injunction in court so. What my story showed is that since about October and maybe before they they well and it indicates before they've been um, you know go, you know uh, undertaken a campaign to you know call, contact MLAs and sort of you know uh, revising their tactics as as they go on like oh well don't send one email to every single MLA send one email or send an email to just your own MLA and that sort of thing it was it's very specific. And we also saw a push and, you know, and it's interesting that since kind of since they've been run around, there have been no new public health restrictions, even though people were pushing for gathering restrictions. We were the only um, one of only two provinces and that didn't have gathering restrictions at Thanksgiving. Um, the only province to not introduce anything new for the Omicron wave and in fact, you know, scale back a few things. Um, and yeah, we see we saw a push at the beginning of the month from them to like, 
you know, because he hinted, OK, well, maybe these are coming to an end soon and to make sure that he does end them. And again, you know, when he announced the, the end, you know, it's time to heal the divisions. Well, again, that's that's language straight from this from this group. So it's it's been and there's nothing wrong, of course, with citizens banding together. But the more you, you know, you read the comments on this site, you can tell these are, you know, a, to, to be as kind as I can vaccine skeptics and the fact that they are thinking about going to sites like Telegram and MeWe suggests that, the, and, and the fact that Facebook suspended them and has been censoring their pay, their uh, private Facebook page shows that, you know, they've been sharing some stuff that, you know, isn't mainstream or, you know, is, is really, you know, anti-vaccine, despite the fact they say, oh, no, no, we're not anti-vaccine at all. And and they say they're going to keep keep at it, too. They want to keep continuing to be an, uh, to be a, a player in Saskatchewan and, and maybe even even, you know, wider than Saskatchewan. Well, they, they clearly seem to, as your piece showed, they they clearly have had influence on this provincial government. I don't think Scott Moe uh, can deny this. Jeremy, how is this playing into the whole COVID thing? We're not getting information on COVID right now. We'll hopefully get an update on Thursday as to the most recent numbers, but we're not even getting things as basic as how many people have died since I think February 5th or 6th, last time I looked. Did Scott Moe have anything to say about COVID today, per se, in terms of how they're dealing with this? I know I know, you guys did talk about the upcoming budget, uh, but yeah. without PIOC and without other... other uh, uh, regular press conferences is do we really know what's going on right now in terms of how they're uh, handling the uh, pandemic other than what we hear from Zach and a few other reporters <laughs> about leaks in terms of how many hospital number uh, how many are in hospitals what did the previous say about that today I know for sure I, I guess Zach's our best resource right now I mean, Zach is knowing, our best resource right now <laughs> in terms of knowing what's happening um, you know hospitalizations are, are are up we're seeing uh, surgery issues right now some delays in Yorkton and uh, other areas of the province you know he was asked about this today and the premier did acknowledge that uh, they are seeing surgical issues right now um, but it kind of stopped there just at that acknowledging that this is happening he did mention that you know they're going to continue to invest in more in health health care and do more on the surgery stuff which we've seen before they have announced that so that was that was main his main message um it's just kind of acknowledging it but again um no no real sense of cons uh, like real concern if that makes sense like it didn't seem like this was a a dire issue that we're facing in the province in terms of his tone. It was just kind of like, yeah, this is happening and it's probably going to be happening for quite some time. Even after COVID, we're going to be seeing surgical issues and we have a plan to deal with that. So that was my impression of how he responded. I, I, well, I, 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 so go ahead, Phil. Go ahead. Uh, but, but, you know, back back to, uh, you know, the pressure from Unified Grassroots, the, the end of, of daily updates, as far as I know, there was nobody calling for that, right? I, I seen, I saw nothing on their Facebook pages that said this was something they were getting from them. That just seems to be a way for the government to, uh, you know, cover things up. Like we don't want you to know. I mean, hospitalizations from COVID are, are um, at an all-time high right now. Like, why does the, the people of this province not have the right to know that? And I think, I think the implications are wider, right? When you look at the uh, at the um, Canadian map of of COVID, we have a zero on it because we haven't reported cases uh, in a while. And like, you know, how is it going to affect tourism down the road if we continue down here? Are you going to go to a, a jurisdiction where you know what the COVID cases are? Or are you going to go to one where you have no idea? Or are dealing, you know, if, with all of our uh, uh, information being like a week late now, we could be in a much better spot than we were a week ago. And yet the most recent information we and people outside the province have is that, oh, look at how how high hospitalizations are. I don't, I think it was a very clumsy idea of theirs and I'm not sure it actually serves serves anyone very well. Yeah, Scott Moe is going uh, full bore in terms of his messaging and his policy track in terms of getting uh, the border open when it's not being closed by protesters. Uh, and, uh, removing any backs restrictions related to truckers and whatnot. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm surprised he, they didn't lead with this in today's announcement because it actually is pretty big news. But uh, uh, Premier Mo and Premier Kenny has jo have joined U.S. government uh, governors in calling both the prime minister of this country and the president of uh, the United States to remove these restrictions. What did he have to say about that today, uh, Jeremy? 
<laughs> that was not brought up today at the press conference. Yeah. That letter came out after. But um, yes, yeah, so he's part of this big letter saying, you know, take get rid of these or, or sorry, reinstate these exemptions so we can allow unvaccinated truckers to go across the border and deliver these goods. And they're calling on this from both uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau uh, because they say in, uh, North American trade is going to be impacted. We're going to see uh, supply chain issues, which is so interesting because we had these blockades cause supply chain issues. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> but but that is uh, that is what they're calling for uh, today in this letter. There's an awful lot of fodder here for an opposition, Phil. I'll just end up off with with you. but. Can Ryan Miley, under the circumstances of not being able to hold a safe seat like uh, Athabasca, capitalize in the in legislature or elsewhere right now uh, under the circumstances uh, of this? Because I, it, I think that losing a by-election to this, even though it is just one by-election, there's all kinds of circumstances as to why it, it may or may not happen. It's a body blow to Ryan Miley, and uh, his leadership was already a little precarious. Yeah, and I think there's people uh, who look at, uh, <laughs> at well, I mean, I, th I think we've seen some polls that suggest the NDP is gaining, particularly in the cities. Yeah. So, I mean, so I mean, this by-election loss will come as a bit of a, a shock, I think, to to NDP supporters and and probably SAS party supporters and you know people who don't support either party. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, I think it it. Well, certainly, you know, his, his uh, uh, there's always been people in the party who wonder whether he's the right person to lead it. Um, I don't know that they have uh, uh, an obvious successor in mind, and but who knows? As soon as, you know, you sense the uh, the leader might be on his way out or be vulnerable, that's when you sort of see people, you know, coming out of the woodwork uh, to replace them. But uh yeah, I mean, you know, you think of the the NDP has had three different leaders in the last three elections. That hasn't served them well. But, you know, there's, I'm sure people wringing their hands in the party saying, oh, if we had a better leader, would we be doing better against and against Mo? Because, you know, most, pe most people, you know, opinion polls show most people don't support the blockades. I don't know how that breaks down in Saskatchewan. But, uh, you know, I mean, opinion polls have shown us all sorts of different things about lifting restrictions and, and that sort of thing. And I think uh, I think some of the questions in those polls have been poorly asked. They just said, do you want to get rid of restrictions? People said, yeah. But I saw a more, a more thoughtful one that said, you know, do you think uh, restrictions should be uh, lifted if there's not a, a, a crush on on, uh, on hospitals? And that one kind of got two thirds support. So yeah, the Leger yeah. poll was a little bit more interesting than the Angus Reid poll that, that I think you. Yes. That, that really didn't tell you enough of, of anything. I, mean, I, I wish um, we could uh, go ahead. Oh, to I just, want, I just want to add one thing. Sure. Um, we just haven't heard, like Ryan Miley hasn't said anything publicly today on Twitter or social media. That's right. So That's we're right. all kind of watching for his response today. We haven't heard anything yet. Um, I also think it's interesting how um, the NDP did spend a lot of time up in that Northern riding, Good point. right? Yeah. And it does kind of suggest, were they worried at all? And why did they spend so much time on what was considered a safe seat? So there are those questions too. But. Yeah, and severe organizational questions. Uh, in, in, who would have thought that this would be the week where we would be talking about Ryan Miley being in trouble as, as opposed to Scott Moe? And, and <laughs> that's, why, that's why politics is always so fascinating to me. I thank you both, Bill, uh, Jeremy, for uh, uh, joining us uh, on uh, Inside the Marble Palace this week. And we'll hopefully catch up sometime soon. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. So once again, thanks, guys, and, uh, and thanks for your insights.